Hey guys! What are you looking at? Oh, this? What's that? No! I'm not gonna review anything from this! This is the movie shelf, you sillies! This is a gaming channel now. Okay, no, the first part of the video was a joke. I mean, we are talking about a video game today, but before we do that, I want to ask a question. If I say comedy duo, be they real or fictional, who comes to mind? Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, Cheech and Chong, Statler and Waldorf, Penn and Teller, Beavis and Butthead, Bill and Ted, Wayne and Garth, Jane, Silent Bob, Harold and Kumar, Donald and Melania, Garfunkel and Oates, Key and Peele, Red and Link, Danny and Aaron. Or maybe even Bob Spencer and Terrence Hill if you dig really deep. While I was mentioning all of those, how many of you were going, oh, when is he gonna mention Asterix and Obelix? Probably not a lot of my American viewers would be my guess, so let's look towards Europe for a bit. Asterix is a long-running French comic book franchise created in 1959 by René Goscinny and Albert Uderzo, all about a small Gaulish village in the year 50 BC that remains unconquered by the Roman Empire, all thanks to a magic potion supplied by the druid that gives them all super strength. The main characters are the short but clever warrior Asterix and his large dim partner Obelix, who fell in the pot of magic potion as a baby and has been blessed with permanent super strength as a result. Together, the two fight off Julius Caesar and his increasingly bizarre attempts to conquer the village. That is, when they're not traveling the world for one reason or another and interacting with every hilarious European stereotype imaginable. Now, you have to understand, this franchise is huge in Europe. There have been 38 comic book albums, 10 animated feature films, 4 live action feature films, and one theme park in France that I actually visited when I was 8 years old. And though the torch has been passed down to new creators, there are still more comic book albums being made to this day. This series is highly beloved for its combination of cartoony slapstick, silly yet clever wordplay and social satire, which sometimes remains very relevant to this day and... sometimes not. Here in Denmark especially, the cartoons are considered absolute classics thanks to the frankly amazing translation and dubbing, and you'd be hard pressed to find someone my age around here that hasn't seen them at least once or can't quote them off the top of their heads. Hell, it's to the point where the 8th animated movie, Asterix and the Vikings from 2006, was animated by a Danish studio. I was actually an intern at the studio that made this movie back then when I was in 7th or 8th grade or something, and I remember spending my lunch breaks walking up and down the halls and looking at the storyboards and just being in total awe that I was watching an Asterix movie being made. My point is, Asterix is a huge deal over here, and I very much grew up with both the comics and the films. And lo and behold, there are also video games. Quite a few of them, actually. And among them, we find the XXL series of 3D beat-em-ups. Originally, there were only two games in the series, but earlier this year, a third game titled Asterix and Obelix XXL 3 The Crystal Mania was released. So, I thought it would be fun to share a little bit of European culture with you guys, and to check out the first two games in the series. So, let's break out our trusty old PS2s and get this train going! We begin with Asterix XXL, developed by Atari Europe and released in 2003 for the PS2, GameCube, PC and Game Boy Advance before reaching the US the following year under the title Asterix Kick Buttocks, which I have to admit is pretty hilarious. And if you're not familiar with the comics, then good luck enjoying this opening cinematic. It's just a long silent sequence of Asterix and Obelix hunting boars, which is their favorite food in the comics and one of their most common activities, with no dialogue or colorful intro to tell you the base premise of the series or even our main characters' names. And then they find their village in flames and discover that everyone's been captured and scattered in cells in different locations all across Europe. Gaul, Normandy, Athens, Helvetia, Egypt and finally Rome to be exact. So off they go on a beat-em-up adventure to bash literally thousands of Roman heads and rescue their friends. Fantastic start, really. Bravo. Now the first thing you're gonna notice if you're familiar with the series is that the game's graphics are spot on, at least when it comes to the characters. There's a little extra bit of detail to their design for that extra edgy 2000 badass factor I suppose, but every character looks like they stepped right out of the comic books, complete with a fun cartoony bounce to all their movements and romance that comically go flying when you beat them up. By all accounts, they've absolutely nailed the look of the source material. Unfortunately, that's kind of where my praise ends. The game itself is about as basic as a beat-em-up can be. You literally just go through each level beating up Romans by the dozens and collecting their helmets for currency in order to buy some combat combos and other upgrades along the way, like temporary life bar extensions. You can jump, use your one attack button to beat the crap out of everything in your way, as well as grab and dash. 
and on occasion, the brawls are broken up by little platforming puzzle segments where you switch between Asterix and Obelix in order to advance. It looks fun enough for about an hour, but man does it get stale fast. I wish there was more to say, but what you see right here? This is the whole game, guys. Okay, no, to be fair, there are a handful of little touches that gives it a little bit more of an Asterix feel. For instance, to get around the fact that some enemies carry shields, you can send Obelix's tiny dog dogmatics to bite their asses and make them lower their guard. That's pretty funny, and it's really the closest the game ever gets to using the comic sense of humor in their gameplay. But unfortunately, Dogmatics is so tiny that I keep forgetting he's even there with me. Hell, if I even remembered he was there, I'd probably just be terrified to think that he was getting trampled by the hundreds of Romans on screen. Now oh, that's great, thanks Atari! Now I have a mental image of squished puppies! Hey! There's also the fact that health pickups are, naturally, boar meat, and that you can get it from wild boars just by slapping them as you walk past, which is all kinds of hilarious. And since you only control one character at a time, most often Asterix, you can sometimes just hear Obelix slapping sausage in the background. I really gotta watch my phrasing. Oh, and your save points are sleeping druids that you slap awake to have them save your progress. Because there is nothing in life that is quite as hysterical as elder abuse. And of course, it just wouldn't be an Asterix game without magic potion. Every now and then you can find a flask of the good stuff in particularly large brawls, and for a time you can smash practically every enemy in like half the hits. Seriously, making dozens of Romans go flying in a few seconds is great fun. One of the better parts of the game for sure. And now that I've given credit where credit is due, let's talk about the annoying parts. First of all, the music is fucking weird. I mean, it's not bad exactly, but... Well, you tell me if this is what you imagined the game would sound like when you heard French comedy series set in 50 BC. Totally appropriate, right? Like I mentioned, Romans drop their helmets when they get beaten, and you use these helmets as currency. Given that the cost of new combos very quickly skyrockets to the many, many thousands, the game tries to get around this by adding multipliers around the levels, making each helmet you pick up temporarily worth anywhere between 3 and 20 times as much as normal. And you know, I really love the way these multipliers are often hidden in crates that are completely identical to the crates that contain helmets. Oh, I just love bashing every crate in an area and collecting every helmet, only to find a multiply by 20 in the very last one that is now completely useless. Because I love having to know beforehand which specific crates to smash before I start grabbing helmets. That's some great A game design. Wouldn't Crash Bandicoot just have been so much better if none of the crates had any visual indicators of their purpose and you never knew if they were Wumba crates, Bounce crates, one up crates, or fucking Nitro crates? Mwah! Truly the most scrumptious of genuine gameplay challenges! The between brawl puzzles are a real chore too. It's not that they're hard to figure out, they're just boring. They all basically boil down to pointing a catapult in the right direction or moving a few boxes, and boy do they get carried away with these torch puzzles here! Every now and then Asterix will grab a torch that he needs to light something at the end of a path. But the torch is on a timer, so the path is littered with fires you gotta light along the way. And you do this by switching to Obelix to clear the path while Asterix keeps it lit. <laughs> Keeping it lit. D did I do that right? Did I use that right? Lit. Is that... is that the right term? Am I hip with the kids? At the end of each stage, which are all ridiculously long by the way, you end up battling the boss. And no, I did not misspeak. I said the boss. Because you fight the same goddamn boss every time. Yes, at the end of every stage, you end up fighting this same huge war machine. The trick in every fight is to get it to reveal the big button on top while dodging bombs, press it with a conveniently located cannon shot, and then hop over the now extended rollers to bash the screws holding them in place until the whole machine breaks. It's not even that it's an awful boss fight exactly, it can actually be kind of fun, but again, it's the same one in every level. The only difference is that the arena changes along with the amount of bombs it throws and how many other enemy soldiers are on screen. And good lord does that go overboard by the Egypt stage. Look at this shit! This fight is not difficult on paper, but you can't see what the hell you're doing because of all the bombs! And if one of those bombs hit you, it can push you into insta-kill lava! Which is really fun when you literally have one screw left to beat, but now you gotta start over. Oh, what a shit show. 
And what's your reward for beating these bosses? A brief cutscene where you rescue two of the comic book villagers, none of whom have their charming personalities from the comics. The closest we get to some fun comic book accuracy is Obelix briefly crushing on Panakia and a split second of sass from the chief's wife Impedimenta. That's it. That's all you get. Good grief. And I hear you out there crying, oh, but Ash, surely there is something extra for the player to do. And, well, you're right. There is one thing. Yes, other than moving in a straight line in order to beat the game, it does have one collectible. In every level, you can find hidden golden laurels stashed away. Collecting all the golden laurels in one level unlocks an alternate costume for either Asterix or Obelix, and on top of just being fun to look at and being funny shoutouts to certain issues or characters from the comics, they award the player with useful extra abilities such as diddly fuck and what does substantial reward mean? That's right ladies and gentlemen, the costumes are purely cosmetic. They serve no purpose! But you know what? Fuck you game! I will get them all! Just to show my viewers everything you have to offer, no matter how little that is. Thankfully, they're often just lying around a little bit out of your way. That is, except for when the Roman defector that serves as your tutorial guide makes you do a sliding minigame to earn one. And let me tell you, those slide minigames can GO JOIN FATHER Karis's MOTHER! Basically, what you gotta do is grab as many helmets on the way down a slope as you can, which is often only possible by making sure you grab the multipliers along the way. That would be fine if it didn't CONTROL LIKE ABSOLUTE ASS! LOOK AT THIS! No matter what you touch, you bounce all over the place, and good fucking god is the slide in Egypt one of the most infuriating things I've ever tried to accomplish! I mean, it's just fucking impossible! It keeps throwing me in every other direction than the one I want, and I swear these rocks are specifically, scientifically tailored to hit you precisely when you're going the intended route! Oh, yeah, you can actually die during these! And when you fail the game, and you have to start over, this little turd gremlin has the fucking gall to tell you to hurry up! <laughs> Go. Seriously though, this has got to be one of the most annoying chores I've ever been given in a video game. It makes me want to kick down the door to an orphanage and tell all the children that Santa isn't real. This shit could make a nun outswear James Rolfe's collective video library in five minutes! HP Lovecraft's entire pantheon of elder gods would lose their sanity feebly attempting to grasp the incomprehensible horror that is this game's controls! It makes me want to adopt a rescued kitten just so I can strangle it for that one sweet moment where I get to be the one inflicting pain. Whoever designed this track better get their ass moving because they're late, they're late for a very important date with the pointy end of a fucking broadsword! Okay, I finally got it after like 45 minutes of trial and error. I have every gold laurel so far and there are only three in Rome, the final stage. So it has to be a short one, right? Let's go. A th a th a th a th a, th a THOUSAND ROMANS?! Yes, I am not joking! This game takes a ridiculous difficulty spike halfway through the Egypt stage, and all of a sudden you have to fight a THOUSAND ROMANS! There are no potions, barely any health, and it starts off with the first hundred enemies being shielded Romans with long ass spears that take forever to knock out! And then you have to fight 900 regular foot soldiers! Oh, and did I mention that the regular foot soldiers do not drop health? I'm furiously spamming all my combos to try and stun as many enemies as possible, but the furthest I ever get is to the last 200 or so before they just whittle me down. Jesus Christ, I'm begging you, please get born 50 years early and end this nightmare! Alright, you know what though, Th there is a combo in the game I haven't bought yet, and maybe that one combo will make the whole difference. So, let's just go back a level and go to the upgrade store. Right! Grinding it is then! Yes? That is actually what the last combo costs. So I figured I can just go back and beat the last boss a few times to get those extra helmets fast. You wanna know how many helmets you get for beating this boss? About 8,000. Meaning you would have to beat it up to 10 times to afford that combo. And oops, just kidding, there's another combo that costs twice as much, holy shit! <sighs> I can't do it! I can't beat the first screen in Rome! Not after that Egypt slider! <laughs> I'm done, man! I quit! And do you wanna know the worst part? This game doesn't even have the decency to be genuinely terrible. I mean, if this was an unplayable mess, it would have an excuse, but no! It's a perfectly playable game, with a lot of care put into the graphics. 
It's just monotonous and cranks up the difficulty by turning the bullshit dial! And I still have a whole other game to play! The second game, Asterix and Obelix Mission Last Vacuum, was released in 2006 on PlayStation 2, PC, PSP, and the Nintendo DS. But unlike its predecessor, it didn't actually make it to the US. At least not until the remastered PS4 version developed by Osome Studio came out in 2018, though only as an eShop game. And yes, that is the version we're gonna be playing. It's actually surprisingly hard to find a decently priced version of the original PS2 game, and this is just more convenient for me. Now, the remaster has added a lot of extra things to the original game, like a much more expensive upgrade system, three separate difficulty settings, and some unlockables, but I like to think that by mentally removing these from the game, I can get a pretty decent idea of what the original version was like. Because even with all these new additions, it's a lot better, but still not exactly great. Anyway, Mission Las Vegas immediately starts off with a much more interesting premise than the first one. This time around, the unthinkable seems to have happened. The druid Getafix, who supplies the village with magic potion, seems to have betrayed the village and sold out his other druid friends to Caesar. And so, with the help of another Roman defector spy, Asterix and Obelix go to Caesar's huge resort Las Vegas in order to free the druids, track Getafix down and figure out what is going on. Now, obviously, the remaster has done a massive touch-up to the graphics, and oh my god, it's gorgeous! It's bright and colorful, and everyone still has their awesome dynamic cartoony movements and models. The only thing that hasn't been given a touch-up are the old cutscenes, but given that they're pre-rendered, that's understandable. And really, with how heavily stylized the game is, they've actually aged pretty well, all things considered. But we learned the hard way last time that good graphics do not a good Asterix game make. So, let's take a look at the gameplay. Well, it's still a somewhat monotonous button masher. You still go through a bunch of levels and beat up scores of Romans, and you still do a bit of platforming and puzzle solving between brawls, but a lot has been done to streamline it. First of all, the sheer number of enemies and helmets needed to collect has been trimmed down immensely, and combat is a bit more varied. You can grab and stomp Romans, comically throw them, suplex them, or even use them as a whip to beat up more Romans with, and it's just really fun to do. You can even switch freely between Asterix and Obelix now, allowing you to almost casually pass enemies between the two for a team combo, and that is super satisfying. Multipliers, magic potions, and life bar extensions are back, but they work differently this time. Rather than pick up absurd amounts of multipliers and crates, finding the potions in set locations, and buying health bar extensions, you can get them by pulling off little combos during fights. It's a good idea and it gives you incentive to switch things up in combat, but it does get a little awkward since they require you to pull combos off on specific enemies, which can be a little difficult when there are like 30 of them on screen. The music has been improved too. Somewhat. It's still a little weird, but not quite as jarring as in the first game. And yet neither game has used any version of the song Asterix et La. And that's just a crime! Really, Mission Las Vegas is pretty much the same game as the first one, just better and more balanced. Oh, and the game has much more personality this time around too. There's more cutscenes, Asterix and Obelix get into some classic banter like in the comics, and there are a few funny gags like Obelix constantly dropping a rock on the poor Roman spy, as well as the other druids having hilarious names like Batamix and such a fuss. Not all of these jokes land perfectly, it can be a little awkward in places, but god is it refreshing to see after the first game, which was basically just a stock beat em up template with an asterisk skin. Really? That's the main thing that sets this game apart and makes it much more enjoyable to play than the first one. Because they really tried to adapt the comic sense of humor to a video game environment. Remember when I said the comics had a lot of contemporary satire? Well, in this game, they translate that to making an absolutely staggering amount of video game references. It begins right on the cover art. I mean, look at that. That is a spot-on pastiche of the PS2 Grand Theft Auto games. But believe me, it doesn't stop there. Over the course of the game, you use Bomberman heads to blow up Tetris walls, you can go down giant Mario pipes, there are Donkey Kong segments, Mortal Kombat and Space Invader wall decorations. There's even a few characters that are just giant references in and of themselves, like your tutorial guide, Sam Schiffer, and Caesar's right-hand man, Larry Croft. He even dresses the part. This centurion worries me. Why does he dress in those ridiculous trousers? Can't he wear a skirt like everyone else? Get it? It's funny because he would probably have said it the other way around nowadays. Hilariously, there's actually a bunch of Tomb Raider posters and even a few Tekken ones with him in them too. And they're always good for a laugh. Really, the attention to detail is crazy. And the best part is, even the basic enemies are based on video game characters. 
Sure, there are still some standard Romans here and there, but over the course of the game you'll fight Romans dressed like Sonic the Hedgehog, Rayman, Ryu from Street Fighter, Pac-Man, and the Italian stallion himself, Mario. He's even wearing the flutter device from Mario Sunshine. Those Romans are crazy! Now, there are some people who feel like this is trying way too hard, and I totally get where that's coming from. But personally, I vastly prefer this over how repetitive and boring the first game felt. By all accounts, this is a huge improvement. But that said, it's still not exactly fantastic. Fun character models, gameplay upgrades, and fancy new graphics aside, this is still a decade and a half old beat-em-up, and it shows. There's not much in the way of variety, and while there are some new collectibles in the form of postcards and crystal helmets hidden in the stages and some figurines you can buy in shops, all you get for grabbing them are a few amusing still images and some console achievements as far as I can tell. The biggest disappointment in this game is that of all the things it decided to carry over from the first game, you still fight the same boss in every level. This time it's a Roman Hulk that has been experimented on with a new magic potion, and all you gotta do is get him to touch certain spots of the area, which triggers a mechanism that leaves him vulnerable. Again, it's not awful, it's just repetitive. And really, it's just wasted potential. Now, I do get it to a certain extent. In the comics, a lot of the humor is derived from the fact that the heroes are comically overpowered, so I can totally understand why it might be a little difficult to come up with a boss fight. But of all the places to go nuts with wild creative boss ideas, I just don't understand why they didn't do so in the game that is built entirely on video game references. I mean, you've got Mario, Sonic, Rayman, all kinds of cool characters running around, so why not use their games for inspiration? The comics had this great running gag of the Romans using their shields to build really bizarre things with their army formations. So wouldn't it have been awesome to see a bunch of Roman soldiers make up one of the egg bots? Or fight a group of Mega Man robot master style Romans? Or like, I don't know, a magic potion powered gorilla with a tie around his neck with a little laurel on it? I mean, the possibilities are endless, so why do we fight this guy? I just don't get it! But unfortunately, this game makes no use of any such ideas. Instead, it just settles on giving you more of the same. The only slight variety is that you get to fight Larry Croft at one point, but he's basically just a slightly more powerful Roman that you gotta butt stomp in order to hurt. And near the end you fight 88 Julius Caesars, for some reason, before fighting that goddamn Roman Colossus again. And then at the very end you get a comic book accurate ending with everyone enjoying a feast in the village. Good stuff, but underwhelming. And sadly, that's ultimately the main word I can use to describe the Las Vegas remaster. Underwhelming. Don't get me wrong, it's a massive improvement over the first game, and probably over the original sequel if we remove all the remaster's additions. But it's still a repetitive beat-em-up through and through. It's pretty fun to pick up and play for about an hour at a time though, so if you really want to play an Asterix XXL game, just play this one and get it on sale. The first one I really can recommend for anyone but the very most hardcore fans. I haven't played the third game yet, and given these games track record and the price tag, I'm not in a hurry to do so. It seems to have added co-op and done a fairly big gameplay overhaul though, so who knows, I might pick it up on sale one day. After all, the Asterix franchise is a huge part of my childhood, and I will always love those intrepid goals with all my heart. See you next time, everybody. Thank you for watching me ramble about Asterix for a while. This franchise means a lot to me and to a lot of people in Europe, and I hope now you can see why. I would like to thank YouTuber Wishing Tikal for letting me use some of her Las Vegas footage after I lost some of my own recordings. You can find a link to her playthrough in the description below. If you like what you saw, don't forget to click the like button and leave a comment, perhaps about some of your own favorite European comic books. Lord knows there are plenty of them. As always, special thanks go to Warren Miller, Silvermoon Ravenwolf and all my other patrons for supporting what I do. It's so cool guys, thank you. And if you want to support me as well, you can find links to my Kofi and my Patreon pages in the description below. And of course, if this was your first video on my channel, don't forget to click the subscribe button as well as the little bell to be notified when new stuff comes out. I look forward to seeing you there. Bye-bye.